my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Kindred Bravely. From adorable maternity wear to comfortable nursing bras, this mom-owned company has you covered. See all of their comfy clothing at kindredbravely.com. I especially love their Simply Sublime nursing tank. I talk about it all the time. And all of their high-waisted leggings are amazing for pregnancy and postpartum this time of year. At the end of this episode, Lauren and I will be chatting about all of both of our favorites from Kindred Bravely. And you can use the coupon code Birth hour for 20% off your purchase at kindredbravely.com. All right, before we get to today's episode, I just want to remind everyone that our Know Your Options childbirth course is open for enrollment and we have a coupon code 100OFF for $100 off your enrollment. You can get all of that information at thebirthhour.com slash course. This course will take you from the final weeks of pregnancy through preparing for childbirth and then all the way into feeding your baby, going back to work, whatever that's going to look like for you. We cover it all and we also do bi-weekly Zoom calls and we have a really great Facebook group where you can get your questions answered, anything that comes up and it's lifetime access. So sign up no matter what stage of the journey you are in. We would love to have you. We have multiple people who have come back for subsequent pregnancies, which is always so fun to see. So we would love to get to know you in that group and help you through this process. So again, that's the birthhour.com slash course. And if you're new to the birth hour, you may not know that we have a Patreon group. This is a place where you can support the work of the birth hour by pledging a certain dollar amount each month, starting at $1 a month, all the way up to $10 a month. And with that, you get certain perks like access to all of our archived episodes. So that's over 500 episodes, not in the general public podcast feed, access to our Facebook group, which is a really supportive, amazing place to hang out and get to know people going through similar things. And then other perks like expert interviews, our partner podcast for our co-producer levels, all that information is at patreon.com slash birth hour, and you can get a discount by signing up for an annual membership. You get a month free. So check out all that information at thebirthhour.com slash support or patreon.com slash birth hour. All right. Today's guest is JJ. JJ had a pretty wild ride, which we have so many different types of stories on this podcast. So I don't always say that, but she was all over the globe really during COVID and not only facing the challenges of being pregnant during a pandemic at the beginning of the pandemic, but also had a Zika virus scare when she was in Thailand. So I'm going to let her share her story with you, including her open and honest experience with postpartum as well. All right, let's get to JJ's story. Hi, JJ. Welcome to The Birth Hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hey, Bryn. Thanks for having me. The Birth Hour was a big part of my pregnancy and birth, so I'm very excited to talk with you today. Oh, it's so great to hear. And you had, <laughs> I think you'll you'll get into it, so I won't do any spoilers here, but um, you had quite the pregnancy. So I'm glad to hear you had the birth hour to listen to during that. Let's start by just hearing a little bit about you and your family, though. Yes. So I am Jessica and I go by JJ. I'm 35 and I grew up outside of Boston in the U.S., but I've lived outside of the U.S. for over 10 years between Germany, Singapore, Switzerland, and parts of uh, Southeast Asia. My partner of five years and our 11-month-old daughter, we live together as a little family. Um, We're very multicultural, multilinguistic family. My father's German, my mother is American, and then my partner has an Indonesian father and a Czech mother, and we are based out of Switzerland, but currently have our home in Thailand. So it's an interesting life currently. Yeah, definitely. I'm a project manager and business development specialist within the international NGO sector, and I'm currently working for a humanitarian and development organization based in in Myanmar, which is also called Burma. All right. So let's go ahead and start with finding out you are pregnant and what that looked like for you. Great. Yeah. My story kind of starts in early spring 2019. I was living in Geneva, Switzerland with my partner and we decided that it was probably a good time to uh, potentially 
try to start a family. And I always had very regular cycles and everything. So I think I was assuming slash hopeful that it would happen quite easily and quickly. And actually after, I would say the better part of, let's say more than six months, we try, we kind of, you know, you're not not trying essentially and nothing happened. And so um, around that same time of the six month mark, I actually got um, an opportunity to leave Switzerland for a two year uh, work opportunity to go to Myanmar, which is also, like I said, um, called Burma. And work there for two years. And so around this time, my partner and I had a lot of discussions. Okay, what does this mean for our professional lives, our personal lives, etc. And around September 2019, we decided to take the plunge. We were like, okay, let's do it. Let's have a two year, you know, adventure in Asia, put the baby stuff on hold. And then let's do this. And so uh, we both quit our jobs at the end of 2019 to be able to take this opportunity and move across the world to Asia. Of course, this is pre-pandemic, so we were very hopeful this was going to be super fun, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, all part of this, too, was that um, I had very good health insurance uh, while I was still working in Switzerland. And actually, my employer essentially funded freezing eggs and freezing embryos. So part of our plan also was to freeze embryos before leaving on this two-year adventure. Uh, So we could kind of, you know, put the baby stuff at the back of the head, not really have to worry about it. You know, I was in my mid-30s at that point and my partner was in his later 30s. So really just a kind of um, insurance plan. And I had actually donated my eggs in my early 20s. So I was very... I was very comfortable with the procedure and doing all that. So that is something we did in December of 2019 before we took our flights to Burma in the beginning of January. And so from Burma, you know, I got into the work routine. We were loving our new life, et cetera. And I had gotten very bad salmonella. And it, well, in retrospect, it really messed up my cycles because at this point we were not trying to have a baby anymore. And um, long story short, COVID hit. Uh, My employer decided to evacuate us to Thailand instead of staying in Burma because Burma has very, very poor health care. And so they wanted everyone um, to be safe in case things escalated quickly. So they decided to send a lot of us to Thailand. And so we went to Phuket, Thailand. And essentially, like three, four weeks after arriving, I very, very, very unexpectedly found out that I was pregnant. You know, I was a few weeks late and it was just, it was so unexpected because we had tried the year before, you know, we timed ovulation, et cetera. And then we were avoiding it actively. And because of the salmonella, it turned out that my cycle had totally messed up. And when I thought that I was avoiding it, I clearly hadn't. So we found ourselves pregnant in Phuket, Thailand during a lockdown at the beginning of a pandemic. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So what was processing all of that like? And then we'll get into just how you felt during your pregnancy. Yeah, it was very, it was very difficult to be honest. It's kind of like mentally and emotionally when you wanted something very bad, very recently, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, your life took a different turn. You're very happy to to put that on pause. And then the thing that you wanted when your life was stable and um, predictable is now here. And um, it was it was very difficult to process. Like, you know, my partner would tell you mentally, emotionally, it was it was difficult. We didn't know anything at the beginning of the pandemic, too. So was this safe? We had left all of our stuff in Burma thinking that we'd be gone for three to four weeks. And, and there was kind of a no end in sight of when we'd be able to leave Thailand and the healthcare would be able to get. So it was it was difficult. But, you know, after processing we accepted it and we were excited about it. Um, still very nervous about how it would all play out, but we'll we'll probably get into that. Okay. So then what was it like finding a care provider and how did your pregnancy go? Yeah. So actually finding a care provider was quite easy. I mean, it was pretty extreme lockdown in Phuket, Thailand, I think in, in Thailand in general. The COVID cases were really low. And so the medical facilities, which are actually quite good all over Thailand, um, were functioning very well. So we just went to a big hospital on the island and they had lovely facilities. And we did the first scan to confirm pregnancy. And so she did confirm that it was just a date that I would never would have thought was possible, given that I thought I had tracked my cycle. But because of the salmonella, obviously, everything had been messed up. What was great actually about that experience was that I know that friends and family around the world weren't able to have their partners at their appointments due to COVID. In Thailand, that wasn't an issue actually. So my partner 
was able to join me for for all of the appointments we did have on Phuket, which was actually just really great because, as I mentioned, it you know mentally emotionally it wasn't the easiest of times. So, in terms of my early pregnancy, it was funny because during lockdown the one exciting part of the week was going to get groceries uh, because really nothing else was going on, right? And so I remember I was just, I think a little bit before six weeks pregnant and I was so excited to go to the grocery store. I was so hungry. I was getting just so much food and being like, this is great that I'm not nauseous or anything like that. And so we spent a lot of money at the grocery store. And then the next day, extreme nausea kicked in and um, I was essentially nauseous until week 19, I think it was. So yeah, so a lot of nausea. I worked remotely, of course. So every day it was just kind of getting through the day, being on remote calls, doing what I could and (laughs) throwing myself on the bed when it got too much or I was tired. I did try to take, you know, daily walks. So we were actually right by the beach, so which was great. I woke up really early and uh, tried to get fresh air in order to deal with the nausea. And then, of course, our evenings were just cooking whatever food I could eat, which was a lot of carbs that I craved in order to kind of keep the nausea at bay. And then watching a lot of Netflix and playing cards with some of the neighbors. So that was about the first, let's say, 10 weeks of my pregnancy. And then kind of a a big turning point in my early pregnancy was around week 11, my partner and some of the neighbors that we lived around, you know, neighbors at our Airbnb that we were staying at essentially trapped in in Thailand, um, they all came down with mysterious kind of body rashes and headaches and joint stuff. And I remember thinking like when I found out I was pregnant earlier in our time in Thailand, I did Google really quickly Zika in Thailand. And the CDC website said that there had been no recent outbreaks. It was very, very vague, but I didn't think twice about it. It was just like, you know, for me, there was like, oh, okay, nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And so my partner uh, went to the hospital and we both did tests for Zika. So normally they do a urine test. They might have done blood tests too. I don't remember. Either way, these are the two tests that tell you if you've had recent infections. So in the past, like two to three weeks. Two days later, my partner gets the call that um, he has tested positive for Zika. And this was just like, you know, it already hadn't been very easy yeah. um, in terms of everything we were dealing with. And so they called us and they said, OK, you know, you're, you're pregnant and your partner has Zika. You need to come back to, to the hospital immediately. And at the hospital, we met with the infectious disease specialist and they took some more blood in order to do some tests that could confirm if I had had Zika. Now, I won't get too much into it because there's I could talk about Zika for a while, but um, essentially 80% of cases of Zika don't have symptoms. Okay. And so at this point, it was a mystery as if I had had Zika at any point during the previous 12 weeks of my pregnancy because there was a very good chance I could have been asymptomatic. Mm. And... It's very difficult to, so you can do tests to see that if you've had it recently, like I said, two to three weeks, but if you want to know if you've had it, you know, six to eight weeks ago, um, you have to do antibody tests, which actually take quite a while to process, or at least, you know, in the middle of a pandemic and you're on an island in Southeast Asia. (laughs) And so they took a bunch of blood in order to do antibody tests and sent those to Bangkok. Uh, So it was essentially a a wait and see game. This is around the same time that I I did have to tell work that I was pregnant. I wasn't planning on telling them for, you know, at least a a little bit longer, maybe around week 15, but I was missing meetings and there was just a lot of stress. So I ended up telling work. My boss was very supportive and, you know, said, you know, do what I need to do, take some rest and be able to just... (laughs) I don't know, mentally, emotionally prepare if if I was carrying a baby with Zika. Right. And so then we also made it a priority to try to get away from where the location we were living, of course, because at that point it was confirmed that there was mosquitoes that were carrying this virus. And, you know, every day that I stayed there was quite nerve wracking. So what we had to do is we had to take essentially a taxi uh, back to Bangkok because the airport in Phuket was closed. 
And so we took a taxi to Bangkok in order to get away from the active Zika area in order to get a little bit of better health care and, you know, just be somewhere where there's more of an international airport in case we could leave. So then we were physically in Bangkok. We were awaiting test results for Zika. Like I said, they could take quite a long time in order to to confirm if I had Zika. The country was opening up a bit at this point, which was good in terms of flights and possibilities for leaving the country if wanted to. And I forgot to mention one of the reasons we had relocated to Thailand, in addition to the good health care, um, was that my partner and I have different passports. So at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of borders closed. And so we didn't even have the option to evacuate to the same country, which would, you know, I could go back to the U.S. or Germany. He could go back to Switzerland, but we couldn't go back to the same place. But at this point, around my second trip, trimester, we had a bit more flexibility in terms of where to go and what to do. So what we decided was I was a bit fed up with the whole Zika thing. I was scared of like every mosquito I saw, uh, even in Bangkok, you know, and so I didn't sleep well. And I was just feeling not very comfortable with, with continuing my pregnancy in Thailand, not knowing where I would even deliver. So what I did is I, um, I told my partner, stay in Thailand, you know, be close to Burma if anything changes, if it opens up, etc. I'm going to Germany where my father lives. I'm going to get the healthcare that I probably feel a little bit more comfortable with and try to wait things out. And then, you know, let's meet back in Burma and hopefully deliver the, the baby in Burma, which, you know, had recently become our home in January of that year, but it's where all our stuff was. It was where my job was. So we were prepared to have the baby in Burma. So I flew to Germany, I think around week 16 or so, and I lived with my father for the first time since I was, you know, 18 years old in his small German village. And I, my German is okay, but it was quite interesting. Things had been quite open in Germany, so it was quite nice. And I have to say, like I mentioned, I listened to the birth hour a lot during my second trimester, and I would take long walks up and down the Rhine River just listening to, to everyone's story story and, and understanding, you know, what was ahead of me. And it was just such a kind of lifesaver getting comforted by people's experiences. And, um, you know, I was, I was isolated too. I right. just had my almost 80 year old father, um, as my like only friend, only family, et cetera. Cause there, <laughs> there was still some protocols and I didn't have any friends in, in the village, et cetera. Right. So, yeah. I also got some great uh, health care while in Germany. I did the 20-week scan at a specialist center and they confirmed that anatomically everything looked okay, which was a, a big relief just because with Zika, you know, you can have the microcephaly, mm-hmm. but her head looked okay. And then finally she did some more blood tests and it was while I was in Germany that finally um, it was confirmed. I had never had Zika during my pregnancy, which was very, very exciting uh, and such a relief. Right. Of course, you know, I had to be, well, once I was reunited with my partner because we were separated at this point, we had to be careful in terms of intimacy and all of that because as you know, Zika can be carried in bodily fluids. That was fine as well. So that was the second trimester. And then finally in August, Burma had a had a second wave of COVID. It was confirmed that we would not be returning to Burma, that my boss and my my organization wanted me to deliver the baby in Europe and be safe and you know, considering the pandemic, considering everything that had happened. So my partner and I reunited at the beginning of my third trimester in Europe. We <laughs> this seems a little reckless, um, maybe looking back, but I was very determined to have one last vacation before we had a baby. And so the COVID numbers were very low in Greece at the time. And we actually didn't have anywhere to live. My father's apartment was quite small in Germany. So um, we didn't have anywhere to live until November 1st. We had gotten a rental house near Geneva, Switzerland, where we're from. And so we went to Greece for the month of October, which just was you know, after such a difficult pregnancy, everything from the pandemic to Zika to the nauseousness to the not having a home, it was definitely a month of just taking our mind off of things, connecting as a couple again, et cetera. So this was was really wonderful for us. That's so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I recommend anyone, if you can, just, you know, take that baby moon, connect with your partner, you know, do everything you can to kind of get mentally and emotionally ready for what's to come. 
So we're really happy that we did that. And then after that month in Greece, we returned to the Geneva area, actually a little rental house in France because Geneva, Switzerland is surrounded by France, essentially. So we settled into our rental house. It was nice and spacious and we were pretty excited. Of course, then came the second wave of COVID. So cases were really increasing in the area. It was it was quite nerve wracking, maybe for, for everyone else. At least we weren't as scared as the beginning not with the unknowns. So we we settled in and then the same week I was meant to sign off of work to have one month pre-birth in order to like mentally, emotionally, spiritually prepare for the birth, which is pretty typical in, in Europe to kind of take some weeks off pre-birth. So I was very excited, you know, I had been working remote the whole time under not the easiest circumstances. And then that same week that I was supposed to sign off for the one month before, uh, my water broke. <laughs> <laughs> Baby had different plans. <laughs> Baby had different plans. Yeah. So my water broke at exactly 35 weeks, five days. And, you know, looking back, I laughed, but... Uh, We had just done a little bit of a long weekend in the mountains, just an hour away, which had been lovely. And uh, we got into bed. It was around midnight. And of course, there was this gush. And this was my first baby. So I was thinking, as maybe a lot of women do, did I just pee my pants? Um, (laughs) You know, (laughs) went to the toilet. I'm like, I'm not sure. And, you know, just hours before, we were joking about how we hadn't packed the hospital bag how there was so much administrative stuff we still had to do in preparation for the baby. Because when you are unmarried and when you have different passports and when you are not registered where you're living in Europe, um, it can be very complicated to have a child. So we hadn't done any of that stuff. Laughing about it the night before. Ha ha ha. So much to do in the next month. And then, yeah, this. So yes, went to the toilet, wasn't sure, woke up my partner. I said, you know, I think my water just broke. And so we kind of didn't really know what to do. But of course, he called the hospital. We got in the car. Again, we should have packed the hospital bag because we should have prepared for essentially the worst, but we didn't know anything. So we just get in the car with like maybe just a phone charger and like a change of clothes or something like that, which, you know, was sufficient. Essentially, we drive from France to Switzerland. So across the border, it's about 20, 30 minutes. We get to the hospital, they do the test, it's amniotic fluid. And, you know, much to my chagrin, she confirmed, the midwife confirmed that it was, and that I would have to stay in the hospital until I left with the baby, which was definitely not what I was expecting. And of course, because it was the height of the second wave of COVID at this point in Switzerland, my partner was not allowed to come into the room with me. He had to drive back to to the rental house that night. Um, And I wouldn't be able to see him until the next day. And I was actually in the hospital for the following eight days in which the baby came. But um, I was only able to see my partner during the act of birth and then um, one hour a day after that. So that was, you know, not great and something that I'm sure many women that had babies during the pandemic could relate to. It's just a kind of sad part of the whole story. But that aside, I was admitted to the hospital They put me on antibiotics right away. So I've heard that in the U.S. they deliver the baby within 24 hours because they're scared of infection. What the hospital told me was that they would try to hold the baby, not have the baby come until 37 weeks. So that would have been, I think, nine days. And then if the baby still hadn't come by that point, that they would induce me. So I was getting ready to stay in the hospital for, for the next nine days which felt like an eternity at that moment, of course. But the baby, again, had other plans. And two days after I was admitted, so I had done two days of antibiotics via the the IV around midnight of Tuesday. So it was midnight Sunday that I came. I was admitted midnight Tuesday. Contractions really started to, to ramp up. And they weren't, you know, consistent or even very close together, but the hospital definitely made the call that um, that was enough for them to be able to admit me. And I think, you know, because of the circumstances too, they weren't going to try to push the baby in the other direction essentially. So after, I don't know, like an hour or two of contractions, getting more intense, but again, nothing consistent or nothing closer together, they did admit me to the active delivery room. 
it was my desire to try and deliver unmedicated, but it was also my desire, as I mentioned, to have the one month off pre-birth in order to like emotionally, mentally, and spiritually uh, prepare in order to do that. (laughs) So when I was admitted to the birthing room, I was not prepared and the natural birthing room with the tub and everything wasn't available. And so I did the best I could. My partner would probably tell you he is still traumatized from <laughs> how, let's say, dramatic I was. I, I think I, I definitely didn't hold back the, you know, vocalization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. The vocalization. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, everything essentially was in, in French, too. So mm. my French is, is not bad, but it was tricky also to yeah. be able to communicate in, in not my first language during that whole process and the subsequent days, but did my best. And because I had gone into to labor at midnight and hadn't slept uh, since the night before that, I got so tired, you know, it was more the tiredness than the pain that I started to finally think, okay, I think I'm going to have to call it and get the epidural. And I remember asking the midwife saying, if I get the epidural, can I sleep? And she was like, yes. And I was like, let's do it. (laughs) So this was after like nine hours, I think, of, of attempting the unmedicated active labor. And I also was not able to get any gas or any other kind of pain medication because of having been four weeks early, essentially. So they gave me the epidural around nine in the morning which was a little bit nerve wracking. Again, you know, the doctor comes in, she explains everything to me in French after I hadn't slept for almost two days. And, you know, a lot of what she's saying is, you know, if you move in the wrong direction, there's, well, what I heard is there's certain death or disability. (laughs) Um, So it was very scary to get that bedural for me, but luckily it went in fine. It worked wonderfully. I could take like a two or three hour nap after that. My partner went back to the rental house, uh, was able to shower, sleep a little bit. And I remember them telling us that they wouldn't expect the baby until that night. They had administered Pitocin, but given that I had been, I think, around one or two centimeters and wasn't progressing fast, they weren't very optimistic about things going fast. And so there was a moment that I said to my partner, you know, go take a long nap and, you know, do everything you need to do. And thank goodness he didn't. Because right after I woke up from my nap, so probably around noon or something like that, they, you know, roused me and they said, oh, we just checked you and you're 10 centimeters. And I was like, what? I mean, it was so fast. It had all progressed while I was essentially sleeping. And they said, you need to, um, you know, get ready to probably start pushing. And at this moment, my partner had walked through the door. So luckily he came back midday, even though we had discussed him staying out until evening. So he he came through the door, he, you know, sat and, and helped me push. Luckily enough, I pushed for probably less than five minutes. It definitely was not a long time. And this was one of the reasons I wanted to do the the unmedicated birth is because I was really scared of tearing. And I know that, you know, if, if you're able, well, I had read that if you're able to do unmedicated, you're able to listen to your body a little bit more. So I tried to kind of do controlled pushing and all that. But in any case, she came quickly, you know, did skin to skin immediately. And I was, I remember I was really nervous because she was four weeks early and I didn't have any kind of understanding of, is this baby on my chest? Like, okay, you know? And so this was a little bit nerve wracking, but it was a lovely moment as well. She was quite healthy. She was 2.7 kilos, which is, I think, a little bit shy of six pounds. She cried. Uh, She, I think, had scored very well in the APGAR. So everything was fine in terms of the baby. And I kind of understood this more um, after the fact in discussing it. But what did happen at this moment is that they delivered the placenta and then they realized that there was a retained membrane, which is, if I understand correctly, a part of your placenta has stayed inside your body. Mm-hmm. And so during this this moment of, you know, you're bonding with your baby skin to skin, there was also literally like a search team between my legs. Mm-hmm. And it was really weird in a sense. And it was it was difficult to process not only in the moment, but after, because this is also um, a university hospital. So there was a bunch of students, there was doctors, Mm. they could not get this retained membrane out. They were using tools, which, you know, I had had the epidural, but I could feel a lot of it. 
And it was about like 15 minutes or even more that they were looking for this and kind of freaking out because apparently it's it's quite dangerous, you know, right. if it stays in, if it stays in too long. And so finally, after 15, 20 minutes, they did manage to get it. And I still hadn't really understand what was happening between my legs. But, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about how I was able to, to process that after the fact. But, um, but yeah, she was born. She was healthy. And then because she was early, they did, of course, put me in the recovery room with the expectation that we would probably have to be there uh, at least a few days in order f- to check out that she usually for babies that are around that time born, you know, she could regulate her own temperature, jaundice and things like that. So I went to the post-birth recovery. In the end, they told me that I had two tears, one of which was on my cervix and one of which was on my labia. So both second degree. So my dream of having no tears did not come true, but um, luckily, you know, nothing more severe than second degree. And that was also when I learned that you can get a tear on your cervix from birth because I didn't know that that was a thing. And I guess it's quite rare, but it can happen. And so then my daughter Zoe and I stayed in the hospital for six days. She had a bit of trouble regulating her temperature. So it was a lot of temperature checks, a lot of, you know, bundling her up skin to skin. And then after a few days, it was confirmed that she had jaundice. So she did have to go under the blue light for 24 hours. Another side note to to this is that because she was born early, we hadn't settled on a name. And in Switzerland, they make you choose a name within three days, which was actually pretty frustrating because I could only see my partner one hour a day. So we're trying to like, you know, discuss what the name will be, but also trying to spend some quality time together. And they would come in and ask you every day. And we did end up choosing a name that we were neither really were very convinced about. So we did it and, you know, within the three day deadline, but we did end up changing the name after I think she was like maybe two and a half, three months. And we are still in the process of administratively changing it. So just a word to the wise, you know, discuss the name in advance. (laughs) Uh, Don't wait until the last minute. Don't wait until the due date. Uh, Really have those conversations early on. I mean, I know not all countries are like Switzerland in terms of that three-day deadline. But uh, yeah, we definitely learned that lesson on if there are going to be babies in the future. And (laughs) uh, we'll choose the name quite early, I think. All right. So then how was postpartum more long-term? Where did you guys end up living? (laughs) Did anything else crazy (laughs) happen? (laughs) Postpartum was kind of the theme of the pregnancy, not easy. So we went back to our rental house in France. It was, you know, winter. It was the height of the pandemic, the second wave. There was no vaccines. So it was a pretty tough kind of lonely existence for the, let's say for the first few months when it's, you know, you're adjusting to becoming parents, um, you're dealing with the, well, post-pregnancy. So everything physically that was happening to me, a baby that was preterm. So there was a lot of pressure to get her weight back up and all of that. The one good thing for us is because of our very crazy um, pregnancy journey and and life circumstances. My partner wasn't working at this moment, so we were really able to just do it together. There was no, you know, one day paternity leave or two week paternity leave, which is kind of the the standard these days, or at least in, in a lot of countries. So we got to do the parental leave together. Um, my partner was a lifesaver in terms of just getting in those key let's say three hours of uninterrupted sleep when you can, taking naps when you can. I will say breastfeeding was quite difficult for me. I expected, um, well, I didn't expect anything because I hadn't read anything about breastfeeding, which I'll talk about maybe during good resources. But I knew that it would be difficult in the beginning from what the midwives at the hospital said, just because she was so small and so that normally small babies have a bad latch. So I was dealing with a lot of pain, but I remember, okay, this is normal, you know, um, nipple pain, this is normal. And then um, her weight started going up. So I did build confidence and like, okay, even if there's pain, like it's working. But then after, I think it was like six or seven weeks, the pain was continuing and I remember thinking like, this isn't normal, at least from what I've read on the internet, what I've learned from from friends and family. And I had like sharp pain and burning and stinging and things like that, that just seemed quite extreme. 
And um, I did kind of self-diagnose at one point for something called vasospasm, which is when, like I described, like your nipples can have very sharp pain, burning, um, like color changes and stuff like that. And so because of the continuing difficulty, I did end up going to a lactation consultant, which is actually free in France, which was lovely. So around six, seven weeks, this wonderful lactation consultant really helped me with everything from latch to positioning, et cetera. And I would say after that point, it was a bit of a turning point. And I think just naturally my body kind of stopped being engorged and all of those things. And so finally around the eight week mark, things started to get easier. And I'm actually still breastfeeding. So she's 11 months uh, and my goal is one year. So I'm very proud of myself uh, for that. And it was not an easy journey, but I'm glad I kind of pushed through. And then otherwise, in terms of postpartum, I wanted to be able to process my experience at the hospital uh, better. I, I did have difficulty, even though I know that my birth story is not, well, every birth story is unique, but I know that it wasn't traumatic in some ways that many stories can be, but I felt really I don't know, uncomfortable with how things went. You know, I had a very difficult pregnancy with Zika, with the displacement, with the pandemic. And when, then with her coming early, I felt like I hadn't been able to process everything. So luckily, the hospital in Geneva, Switzerland offers a kind of service where you can have a meeting with the head midwife who has a, a essentially a minute by minute transcript of how your birth went, why were the decisions made, what were you administered, etc. And we were able to sit with her a few weeks after the birth and ask questions, okay, but you know, what happened that moment, you know, when they saw that the retained membranes, you know, was inside my body and why was that decision made, etc. So this was this was so great in being able to better process how things went and being able to even just sit with this uh, midwife and my partner and really get a general understanding of the whole experience. Yeah, it's such a great policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish maybe, you know, if, if people start asking in any hospital in any country, it could become more more standard practice. And it wasn't made clear to us that this was even available until I mentioned it just offhand to one of the midwives during my stay after. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like advertised in any sense. Okay. So, But it was really lovely. And another actually great thing about Swiss culture for postpartum is that there's a built-in physiotherapy for pelvic floor mm -hmm. rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So you you also go and you do these sessions with the PT, and uh, they they like put these nodes inside of you, and you they've gamified exercising. So you know you have to squeeze, you have to squeeze long, you have to squeeze short, mm -hmm. and it was really great in order to just start to feel like I was getting my body back in a sense too. And this was was a good part of the recovery, and it was nine sessions. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So this is also something that would be lovely if it became more kind of standard, but we'll mm -hmm. see. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, one last thing to talk about for postpartum was I to admit, let's say, about my postpartum is that I also had a lot of sadness and anger. I, I don't think I would ever diagnose this as depression or anything like that. I think one of the ways I can best describe it is postpartum rage, which actually exists. Mm -hmm. uh, I did Google it because I, I really, I had a short fuse, you know, anything would just kind of make me mad. And, you know, my partner dealt with it really great, but just the smallest things would really just set me off. And of course you're sleep deprived and all of that. But I think, you know, in retrospect, it was something that I dealt with. You know, I went to a little bit of talk therapy at the beginning. It was semi-helpful, but I think just being aware that this was also part of, you know, the hormones and the processing. Right. I think I was also sad that the way I envisioned my first baby was you know, your friends and your family are coming over and you're taking long walks and there's mm -hmm. picnics and there's all of these things that, that, you know, my, my maternity leave would be just lounging around with maybe not a smile on my face, but having this social aspect of it, having, um, all these elements that because of the pandemic, even because of having a, a winter baby just wasn't a part of things. You know, we were scared. I was scared to see people. I was scared to let my baby right. be around people without masks. And, you know, she was preterm. So she, I was even more scared. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it all just, just went into this kind of rage that I felt about, 
this injustice of, of the experience that I expected and the experience that I had. And luckily I've done a lot of like internal work and journaling and um, processing that I, I feel absolutely okay with, with how it is, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, I have a lovely little family and I wouldn't trade anything in the world, but it was definitely not an easy part of the postpartum experience. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I know that, like you said, it's, it's not necessarily depression, but the rage and anger definitely fall into those postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, just as like a way it presents itself for certain people. So I think there's people listening who probably really can identify with that. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you mentioned you had some resources you want to share. What are those? So one part is a big resource for me, which came a bit late in the game, was going to a lactation consultant. I know a lot of people have mentioned this. And I would pair that with advice to do a lot of breastfeeding research before. I didn't have the time to do that, obviously, and it was part of my plan to do it. And so when I all of a sudden found myself with a preterm baby... And wanting to breastfeed, I just didn't know anything about what to expect. I didn't know about engorgement. I didn't know about the pain. You know, I didn't know about latching and all that. And even just the constant feeding, I feel like I didn't even know about it. (laughs) So definitely do your research. Even go to a lactation consultant before the birth. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, where I delivered the baby, as I mentioned in Switzerland, there's midwives that accompany you before the birth and after and if there's something like that where where you live, this is a great thing to be able to take advantage of. And if not, you know, Dr. Google is there to to help you to kind of understand what to expect. So that's a huge resource. Otherwise, I would say, you know, an easy one. Obviously, the birth hour was massive for me. I think when we live in a world where, you know, before we all used to live like with our extended family and we'd see births and we'd be part of births as women and we'd go to our aunt and our sister's births and all that and and you know, it just doesn't happen anymore. So you really don't know anything. And, you know, your amazing podcast just allows you this window into people's experiences, which is just so key. So mm-hmm. obviously, um, the birth hour, I would say other podcasts I really appreciated was Hello Bump, uh, Big Fat Positive. These were fun podcasts just um, about pregnancy and and raising kids and stuff like that. The What to Expect app was obviously great for the week by week. I'm sure I'm not the only one of, you know, what, you know, is your baby the size of a kiwi, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> I found the Hello Belly app helpful uh, for the meditations. They had very simple meditations, um, short ones. And, you know, for me, part of my pregnancy was processing and accepting the circumstances I found myself pregnant in when it wasn't what I envisioned at all. And they somehow beautifully aligned with with a lot of the things I needed to work through. So those meditations were great for me. And then um, I read some, you know, some other typical books, Crib Sheet, uh, Bringing Up Bebe was a great one for me and just interesting in terms of um, not only the pregnancy aspects of that, but postpartum. So how to, you know, help your baby sleep longer in the beginning, what to expect the first year. For me, I wasn't so concerned with the kind of what to expect while expecting. It was, you know, pregnancy is a small sliver of time. And for me, the important part was like, how do I keep a a human alive for the next 18 years, especially for the first year? So that book, What to Expect the First Year, was was a big help in, in understanding the needs of a newborn. And then another one, which isn't really about pregnancy and birth, but that I found fascinating was called uh, Parenting Across Cultures. Like I mentioned, our family is really multicultural and we're from, you know, all over. We're raising our daughter with many languages and cultures. And this author really dissects what the differences between kind of East and West cultures. So it's everything from co-sleeping to how many toys you have. And so if you're interested in kind of reading about um, or understanding how you're going to raise your baby once once she or he is there, I would recommend that book as a fascinating read and how just a lot of what we experience in pregnancy, birth and and raising children is is totally steeped in, in cultures and norms of where we're from. So Great. Well, that was an awesome list. There's some new ones to me as well there. So we'll be sure to put all of those on your show notes page. And then where's the best place for people to reach out to you? 
Yeah. So I'm most probably active on Instagram. My profile name or my handle is JJ. So JJ Fleskis. And and that's F-L-E-S-K-E-S. And if anyone wants to contact me uh, in terms of questions about really anything from, you know, I've done egg donation, freezing embryos, Zika, preterm labor due to rupturing of the membrane, changing the name of your baby after you've already given it a name, (laughs) postpartum rage, breastfeeding. I mean, anything that I've talked about, which I know has been a lot, I'd be more than happy to be a resource to any other women, knowing that some people might just have questions out of curiosity, or if you know these are things you're experiencing, that I'd be happy to, to talk about it, to connect on that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for offering that. And we'll put that contact info on your show notes as well. Thank you so much for sharing your story today. It was so great to hear it all. Thank you, Bryn, so much. And like I said, your podcast is just so important, relevant in a, in a day and age and even a pandemic day and age where we really need to hear about other people's experiences and, and learn and grow from them. So thank you so much. Thank you again for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to chat with Lauren about Kindred Bravely, today's sponsor. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Kindred Bravely. Absolutely. Happy to. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we start talking about Kindred Bravely? Sure. I am uh, married to my wife, Deanna. We've been married for about three years, and we have a 20-month-old daughter, Sawyer, whose birth story we recorded here. And then I'm due any day now with our second, his baby boy. So did you discover Kindred Bravely with your daughter, or is it newer to you? Yeah, I think I actually first heard about Kindred Bravely from listening to your podcast And I, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I found underwear really uncomfortable. I don't know if that's super common or not, but I had a really hard time trying to find underwear that felt uh, good. And so I started with their under the belly hipster uh, underwear. And Mm -hmm. at the time they were using that really, really soft, like bamboo like material. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was the first thing that I purchased from them. And I swear it was like slipping into heaven. It was wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, those underwear are insanely comfortable, and I feel like I was missing out with my first two pregnancies just, like, making normal underwear work because you should totally treat yourself, you know, it's like, I think, $20 for a three-pack or something for butter underwear, (laughs) like you said. Right, it was was well worth it, and I remember after I was pregnant, I decided that I wasn't going to wear them when I was not pregnant so that when I was pregnant again, I would have them there ready. (laughs) So smart, so you don't wear them out. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so I started with those. I think they changed the material for the hipster underwear. So I bought another around this pregnancy and um, they didn't, the sizing didn't fit the same. And just kind of a side note, because they, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I've seen them in their ads talk about is their customer service and they were great. Uh, I messaged them and I was like, I I thought I was buying the same thing and I, I got them and they didn't fit right. And they just sent me a new size free of charge, which was way more than I expected. So that was great. Yeah, they're so great about making making it right for sure. Mm-hmm. What else have you tried? Just the underwear or have you tried any of the bras or tanks? No, I actually, this time uh, being pregnant, I sort of like made up how to wear pajamas in my first pregnancy, which looking back seems kind of silly. I, I think I was that way about a lot of the maternity clothes. I thought, oh no, it'll be fine. I'll just wear bigger size t-shirts or something. But maternity stuff really does feel better. So I got two pair of their shorts pajamas this time. And again, that material is just like, it's just like butter. Putting it on is just fantastic. And it was nice to have something kind of new that was special for being pregnant. (laughs) So that was fun. Yeah, I definitely recommend for the moms out there who are going into the fall, winter baby time frame, the long, kind of like they're almost like legging pajamas with a nursing top that's long sleeves and you can wear them as like long johns or pajamas and I like lived in those. Yeah, I think they're like all, they're almost the same style. It's just the ones that I bought were during the springtime so they're shorts and short sleeve shirt, yeah. And then I I bought their um nightgown too that I'm saving for after delivery in the hospital. Uh, but oh, it's the same nice. material. It's that same cozy 
I just remember last time after having my daughter in the hospital, I was still wearing the hospital gown. And it was when visitors started coming, it was like impossible to keep the whole thing up while I was nursing. And so I decided this time I wanted to have something that was specifically made for me to nurse on one side and not be exposing myself to everybody that walked in the room. That's it made great, the fathers yeah. and brothers uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like I will nurse in public and like I have no problems, but there's something about like my dad and brother that I'm like, <laughs> I, know. I think I'm going to just cover up. Um, I know. <laughs> okay, I just looked it up. It's the Jane Maternity and Nursing Thermal Pajamas. Those things are like the softest pajamas ever. Um, oh, okay. They're long sleeves and long pants, so you probably wouldn't want to wear them in the summer. But I also just talked to someone recently who wore the um, Kendra Bravely labor and delivery gown for like after the baby was born for kind of like that hospital stay when they still needed to check her fundus or her scar and for nursing and stuff. So that's a something to keep in mind too. You probably wouldn't want to wear it if you wore it during labor, but if you didn't. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't seen that one. I looked at... Um it might have been I clicked on an ad specifically for the nightgown, the nursing um, and pregnancy nightgown, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm glad that all those things were working out for you. Yeah, they're great. I, I also have a couple of their um, their bras, the, the Terry Racerback. Mm-hmm. Um, I bought that in two sizes. And I think the only, I mean, that that's really comfortable too, because it's not a really super structured bra. So sleeping in it feels comfortable. Yeah. That's what I use it for. Oh, okay. Perfect. I was going to say I'm not particularly large chested, but it feels like I grow so much when I'm, when I'm pregnant. Crazy. I'm not used to having it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that seems to be working well too. Awesome. Yeah. Those are really cozy. And I know some moms can wear them like all day long, but I pretty much just wear them for sleep. And then I need the the simply sublime ones for during the day. Mm. Yeah, I can wear mine during the day. At least for now, we'll see when Jealous. I'm nursing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me about Kindred Bravely. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Thank you so much again to JJ for sharing her story with us and to Kindred Bravely for sponsoring this episode. Check out Kindred Bravely at kindredbravely.com and use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR for 20% off. If you want other information from today's episode, including all the resources that JJ shared, head over to thebirthhour.com and just search for her name in the search bar and you'll find her show notes page. I'll also link to the Kindred Bravely website from there as well. All right, see you next time. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.